My name is David Spence. Uh, my first name is Charles. If you look me up in the state bar, uh, I didn't know my first name was Charles until I was about eight. Um, it's because my um, my grandfather's name was Charles, and um, his middle name was Dunkerley, and my father wanted to name me after his father, so Charles Dunkerley was never going to get by my mother, and so it. My name is a uh, a compromise. We'll call him Charles. We, we'll name him Charles. He'll have the same initials as Grandpa, but we're, we're going with David. So, anyway, that's I go by Dave. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Let's see if this thing works. What am I pointing it at? Oh, I'm pointing the wrong direction. There we go. Okay, the fine print. Uh, this is educational purposes. Don't use this for uh, selling tax planning ideas. Um, the estate and gift tax regime is all about passing family wealth <clears throat> to the next generation or generations. And uh, so I just kind of liked this cartoon, you know, iPhone, iPod, iPad, and Grandpa says I paid. Uh, so that's the idea is grandpa pays and the kids and the grandkids uh, get away with murder. Um, I'd like to introduce today uh, <clears throat> the second generation of estate planners at Royce Law Firm and that is Michael Zosky. Michael has been with us what about four years now? Yeah something like that and uh, Michael is uh, very uh, competent uh, in the field of estate and gift tax, and uh, he has an LLM. He's a really smart kid, and uh, you should listen to what he has to say. He's going to be talking to us about uh, <clears throat> recent changes in the law. So he's going to give us an update on the new law, and then I'll talk to us, uh, to you, and to myself, I guess. Uh, I'll talk to, to you guys about... Uh, uh, planning opportunities for the coming year. Um, so take it away, Michael. I totally was paying attention when he told me what button to push. Uh, so yes, I'm Michael Zosky. I like uh, that Dave said competent. Um, if not, I'm glad he added smart. That made me feel real good. Uh, and I also don't, I mean, I don't have any fancy fun name stories. I've been Michael for my whole life. But um, so really what my portion of this is just sort of a general update on the estate and gift tax. But just before I get started, how many of you actually practice in the do a little estate and gift tax work or anything of that area? Anybody? All right, more than one. <laughs> okay. So for some of you, this is there's going to be some introduction. Um, I generally like to assume in these sort of things that not a lot of people practice in this area because a lot of... Uh, a lot of times we get, you know, corporate type people, but so, um, ooh, I can see it here too, good. Uh, so just as a general rule, the, you know, with the estate and gift tax realm, um, the IRS uh, taxes estates on their, their assets uh, when someone passes away. Uh, there's an exemption from the estate and gift tax. It's unified together, um, which means that as of right now, as of 2016, uh, a person can die holding $5.45 million and not have to pay any estate taxes. Anything in excess of that is subject to a 40% tax rate. Um, it, you know, a few years ago, uh, Congress granted us a little gift. We like to call it portability, uh, which allows surviving spouses to effectively steal uh, the unused exemption from one spouse to another. Um, in addition to the estate and gift taxes, there's a generation skipping transfer tax, which is a second layer and applies when you are, just like it sounds, skipping a generation. So if I, I don't have any children yet, I don't have any grandchildren yet, <laughs> but if I did, uh, if I gave my money to my grandkids and skipped my kids, it would, there would be an estate tax hit and a generation skipping transfer tax hit. Now, luckily, the exemptions are the same. Uh, so that helps out. But again, 40% tax rate on anything excess there. You cannot use portability for the GST tax, though. So uh, that's, a, that's per individual. You cannot port that to the next spouse. 
Um, but that all, all those two rules apply to uh, U.S. residents and uh, U.S. citizens, and U.S. residents having a different definition than the income tax rules. This is a domicile te uh, test. It's an intent-based test, so you can actually be different. Um, but for non-resident aliens, their exemptions are way lower. It's sixty thousand dollars, and uh, but it doesn't apply to everything. It only applies to property situated in the U.S., which is usually real property, tangible property, and certain other things like U.S. corporate stock. Um, uh, just as a sort of general basis or general basic understanding, uh, you know, maximum federal income tax rate is, is right now 39.6, federal capital gains tax 20%, uh, the Obamacare tax 3.8%, uh, and uh, the earned income tax is 0.9. The 3.8% the tax, you know, you might not think it applies, but when you're doing trust income tax returns, it does apply. Uh, so fiduciary income tax returns, it does apply. And you also hit that top ordinary tax rate really quickly. It's like $12,000 or something like that in income. Um, but so here are the 2017 rates. Well, they're sort of projected because usually by now, the IRS has actually issued what the rates are going to be and the exemptions are going to be. Uh, but because it's the IRS and they like to take their time in doing anything, uh, we don't actually have the final rates for next year yet. Uh, but they're projected, based on the inflation rates that were announced back in September, that the estate and gift tax exemption for next year is going to go up a whopping $40,000 to $5.49 million. Uh, same with the GST uh, exemption. The tax rates are the same, and gift tax annual exclusion, still $14,000, just like it's been for the last few years. Um, I'm guessing at some point soon that might actually go up to $15,000 because it's rounded off. Uh, but not most likely next year. And again, non-resident aliens doesn't change. Their figures are not adjusted for inflation, so that $60,000 is a big deal. So if you have any clients that are non-resident aliens and they own a home in the U.S., uh, that's going to take a huge tax hit um, because, well, especially if it's a you know, California residence where you know, the average price is almost a million dollars. Um, that's a huge tax that they're going to have to pay and if they don't have any liquid assets, that property is going to need to be sold. Um, what I want to talk about right now, right now is the uh, 2017 Green Book. Uh, these are the uh, sort of wishes and what the president would like to have happen for uh, tax, you know, tax matters. And I'm just going to be talking about the estate and gift tax related ones. Um, now, obviously, these are just proposed. They're never. Uh, final list of Congress actually does something about them, but it does give you an indication of what the IRS and what the administrations are thinking. And if, you know, if Hillary gets elected, you can probably assume that some of these will carry over. Um, uh, the capital gains tax rate, they want to increase to 24.2%, which if you add the net investment income tax to that, ends up at 28%, which is not chump change. Um, they want to treat transfers of appreciated property at death or even lifetime as sales. So rather than uh, gifts, they would, when you're making a gift, uh, it would be treated as a sale, which means you would have to realize the uh, capital gains, if there is any, at that time. Um, they want to change that with adding an additional $100,000 per person exemption for capital gains uh, at death, which is portable to spouse. And they also want to, which I actually like this one, uh, they want to make the Section 121 uh, exclusion for residences. That's that your $250,000 or $500,000 if you're married when you sell your house. Exclusion from gain. They want to make that portable to a surviving spouse, which I think is actually a really good idea. Um, most of these I really don't care for, but that one seems good. Um, they also would love to change the tax rate uh, for the estate tax up to 45% and drop the exemption down to 3.5 million for estate and gift, and they also want to uncouple that with the gift tax. So right now, the gift tax, is it's a unified credit. They have the same exemption as the estate and gift tax. But it, didn't, it wasn't always that way, and they want to drop it down that to be a million dollars, not and, and not be adjusted for inflation. Uh, they want to modify the rules for GRATS, which are grantor retained annuity trusts and other grantor trust rules. They don't like that uh, for, you, for those of you who know what they are, um, they're split interest trusts, or for no, don't know what they are, they're split interest trusts that are designed to take advantage of um, getting appreciation out of your estate. Um, but they don't like the way that grats and grantor trusts 
uh, are decoupled from the income tax rules, meaning that you're taxable. If I make a trust, I'm taxable on the income, but the assets are not includable in my estate. So they don't like that. They want to bring them back together. Um, and they also want to uh, deal with the fact that some states have gotten rid of their rules against perpetuities and limit the GST exemption to 90 years. So a trust can only be exempt from the GST tax for 90 years, uh, which in certain states like Delaware would mean that on some of these long-term dynasty trusts, you now have a taxable event once that thing hits 90 years. Now, I think that's a horrible idea, um, but we'll see. Now, this other one, actually kind of like in theory, they want to get rid of the need for what are referred to as crummy letters. These are trusts, or these are provisions in the trust that allow a person to take advantage of the annual exclusion at $14,000. The rule there is that it has to be a gift of a present interest, and when you're gifting an interest in a trust, it's not really a present interest um, because there's all these rules about when you can actually get the money. So smart tax, you know, smart planners came up with these ideas about well, if we give them a withdrawal right as to $14,000 then we can make it a present interest. Well, it's kind of a pain in the butt. It's administrative, it's administrative hassle. It oftentimes doesn't get done. Um, and so they kind of want to get away, away with that, but they're going to limit the exemption from $14,000 per person to a $50,000 annual exclusion for, per donor, which I don't like that part. I like the concept, but I don't, I, I don't like the limitation on the money. Um, and they also want to change the IRA distri distribution rules where on right now when you inherit an IRA, depending on how old the uh, deceased person was. The rule is that you can usually spread those uh, distributions out over your lifetime. They want to stop that and make it just five years, um, which can really be a hard thing. Um, last year, they introduced, the House introduced and the Senate also introduced a bill to repeal the estate tax. That has gone nowhere. <laughs> Surprise. Um, now, these are the tax plans for the two main candidates. I'm not touching on the third party candidates because I think their likelihoods are probably limited. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, not surprisingly for a Republican, wants to get rid of the estate tax. Uh, but he does want to institute a new tax on capital gains at death um, with uh, f for states that are in excess of 10 million. So presumably if your assets are in you know, the gain or I don't know, maybe the assets, uh, he hasn't really fleshed it out. Um, for $10 million or so, uh, will not be subject to this rule, but maybe amounts after that. I'm not really sure. Um, and then not still no one's sure if that's applied per individual or per couple. Hillary, on the other hand, wants to keep the uh, state tax and actually make it bigger, not surprisingly for a Democrat. Um, she wants to increase the capital gains tax and the estate tax and increase the tax rate. So she would, for amounts in uh, between 3.5 and $10 million, a 45% tax rate, um, more than 10, 50 percent, more than 50, 55 percent, and if you are one of those lucky people who has more than 500 million dollars, first off, congratulations to you, uh, but your estates will be subject to a 65 percent, or she wants to make it, you know, 65 percent tax rate. Obviously, these are all proposed, and, you know, Congress would have to get behind them, and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> um, so these are the actual things that are in effect now. I mean, these are new laws. Well, sort of. The proposed regs are still proposed, but they want to get them passed. Um, this was this new rule. This is basis reporting for new IRS form uh, 8971. Um, this was enacted in law last year, but because IRS can't do anything timely, it got delayed and delayed and delayed. And you know, it does it does, does apply to estates who uh, died last year, but the filing wasn't really until this year, and I think it's actually March of this year. Um, was when the actual deadline started to happen. But this new uh, code section uh, requires that a form be filed 30 days after the estate tax return is filed or due, depending on uh, uh, when it's actually filed. If you file it early, good for you. Um, but it's then it's 30 days after that. And it basically, you have to report to the IRS and the beneficiaries what the basis is supposed to be. And this is coupled with... Um, uh, well, real quick, it's not required when the gross estate uh, and the adjusted taxable gifts is less than the basic exclusion amount, which is $5.45 million. Um, it's not required when you're just doing it to make a GST allocation or uh, exemption allocation, and it's not required if you're just filing a return to report portability and, and take the uh, exemption. But it has to, the reason why that exists has to do with this new section here. 
the rule used to be, apparently, which most people didn't know about, that the beneficiaries didn't actually have to accept the basis that was reported on the 706. They could make an argument that I was never a part of the negotiations or determinations of that value, um, and then just try and make their own value. Um, honestly, I had no idea that was a thing. And we were, I was at a seminar and someone announced this and half the room, more than half the room said they raised their hands that they didn't realize this was a thing. Um, but the IRS realized it was a thing probably because someone had done it. Um, but uh, so the rule is now that the beneficiaries basically have to accept the value that is reported on that 8971 or as later adjusted by the IRS. So if they come in and adjust the value in an audit, then that's the value you have to use for your basis when you're filing your income tax returns and, or selling assets that you received as an inheritance. Oh, I guess I should say, for those of you who don't know, uh, when someone passes away, there's a step up in basis for fair market, to fair market value for capital assets. Uh, so that's why this is important. Probably should have said that in the beginning, but whatever. Um, and then the sort of big one is these nightmarish proposed regulations that the Treasury has come up with. Um, most commentators and most of Congress uh, think that it's a giant cash grab and they're overstepping their bounds completely by trying to write new law. And in fact, they kind of contradict the actual Section 2704. So what the Chapter 14 rules are, the special valuation rules, and what they do, uh, for those of you who don't, aren't aware of them, they kick in in certain circumstances to either value something as a gift, when it might not have otherwise been, or part gift and part sale, or they want to change the valuation of something because they're going to disregard certain restrictions in that whatever transfer it was. In the case of 2704, these are restrictions on the value, uh, you know, restrictions that get disregarded for valuation purposes for estate and gift tax that deal with lapsing restrictions in an operating agreement or partnership agreement or buy-sell provision or shareholder agreement uh, in a corporation or partnership. And they also deal with uh, liquidation rights as well. Um, the keys here is, you know, what everyone likes to say is that these things sort of get rid of minority discounts when you're doing uh, an estate or gift tax return. Right now, what a lot of us will do is you know, make, set up these partnerships or operating agreements that are sort of conforming to state law as, you know, what Delaware might, statutes might be, what California statutes might be in terms of shareholder rights or member rights. And those provisions, if you're getting a minority interest, might make it seem like, you know, the value of this isn't a straight, you know, if I'm getting one third of a partnership, the value might not actually be one third. It might be less than that because I don't have control. There's all these crazy restrictions in it, even if they relate to, to um, uh, what the state law said. So real quick, 2704 uh, deals with lapsing rights. So uh, lapses in voting, liquidation, or uh, other rights in a controlled corporation or partnership are treated as transfers, um, which is sort of concerning. So if you ever see anything like in an operating agreement or partnership agreement on a return that you're filing, and uh, someone has, some, any of these rights have lapsed, that's a transfer, so just be aware of that. Um, there is an exception um, where it doesn't apply uh, with respect to interests that are not restricted or termination. That's in the regs right now, and we're fine with those. Um, 270B, 2704B is restrictions on liquidations of an entity. Um, there's three factors that you have to hit first. It has to be a transfer of an interest to a family member, uh, and where the transferor members uh, control the entity before the transfer. Um, and, a, and basically it disregards for valuation purposes certain applicable restrictions, which are the, any limitation on an entity's ability to liquidate uh, that either lapse uh, to any extent after the transfer or can be removed at the transfer. Uh, that's a typo. Of any member of the transfer family. Um, but there's an exception. So if uh, you know, if, you've, if, if your state requires that uh, to liquidate the entity, you need to have a majority of the uh, members agree, or even unanimous members of, or, to be in agreement with that. I mean, that's a big restriction on the right to liquidate an entity. And so that's why, and so right now, the, the rule is in the code, which I think is more important than the regs, personally, uh, the code says if you have a restriction that is the same as the state rule, 
which is again, if you had a unanimous uh, provision, then that applicable restriction isn't an issue for valuation. It just, that's fine. However, that's one of the things that the IRS and the Treasury want to get rid of. Um, the, the proposed regs on the 2704A, not as big a deal. Um, they just make the, the regulatory exemption to transfers made them within three years of death. Um, and that sort of gets back to uh, a code section that exists right now, IRC 2035, that uh, deals with transfers within three years. The big one, I think, personally, is the 2704B changes, and they want to get rid of that state law comparison, and they want to add things as additional restrictions that are subject to these new rules. And in particular, it's uh, you know things like restrictions which limit liquidation proceeds to an amount less than the minimum value, so if you want to peg a value of like a buy-sell at a lower rate, this might come in. Um, it might, that might get disregarded. The rule, you can still have that in your operating agreement or, or whatnot, you know, but that value might get uh, disregarded, that provision might get disregarded for valuation purposes. Or uh, right now, if you had a, you know, a provision that part of the proceeds would get paid out in cash and the rest in a promissory note, those would be disregarded for valuation purposes. And those are pretty common business things that you will see in operating agreements. And the IRS really doesn't make any exception for that anymore. If you, you know, they're getting rid of that exception. And so what a lot of us think is that these are trying to get rid of minority discounts, which they hate. Um, now, the IRS has even said that, uh, you know, if you think that these proposed regs are what's going to be final, then you're kidding yourself or something like that. But I'm pretty sure that's because they've gotten a ridiculous amount of pushback from Congress and from the planning community. Um, you know, there's a hearing scheduled for December 1st on these, so I'm sort of curious to see what actually happens. Um, as a tax nerd, I might actually watch. <laughs> uh, I think it's probably going to be on C-SPAN, probably, I would assume. Um, but who knows what's actually going to happen there. Um, I think they've gotten so much pushback that they, they're going to have to change their tune. Um, just a couple other things. Um, there's a new uh, revenue procedure that deals with a concern that some people had in terms of the estate tax return, um, there was some concern that if you're filing the estate tax return just to make a Q-tip election, that's a qualified terminal interest property election. It has to do with trying to maintain the marital deduction on certain transfers into trust for a spouse. There was some concern that if you're doing that also at the same time as you're only filing an exam uh, a return to claim portability, that they'd sort of cancel each other out. They've clarified that they're not in contract or contra contradictory to each other. You can do them both. Um, and then two things I don't have slides for. Um, they changed the rules on a state tax closing letter. So if you filed an estate tax return and you just haven't seen an estate tax closing letter, you have to ask them for it now. They used to would just send them out on, your, on their own, but because maybe they're short-staffed or they just don't care, uh, you have to actually ask them for it. Um, and, and, and then also, if you, if you don't want to do that, you could also ask for a tax transcript. It, that will tell you if they have accepted the, the actual form as well. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dave uh, for some fun planning opportunities for next year. Uh, anybody, who's got the time? How much time do I have left? It's 25 after. 25 after? Okay, good. Perfect. Good work. Okay. Uh, let me just editorialize a little bit first. Uh, I want to go back to this thing. How many of you do estate and gift tax work at all? A few of you do. Historically, for those of you who do, you know this. For those of you who don't, you may not know that historically, when we subject an estate to tax, that estate is subjected to tax at its fair market value. Fair market value is defined in the regulations and has been for, gosh, 30 years or more. <clears throat> as what would a willing, a hypothetical willing buyer pay and a hypothetical willing seller accept uh, for the asset that was owned by the decedent at the time of death. Now, with this change in the rules, if, if I have a family business, and it's, let's say it's incorporated or let's say it's an LLC, it's a family business, I now... <clears throat> And let's say I've, I've made gifts uh, during my lifetime, or, or, or not. Maybe I even sold the, sold the assets. Uh, but I have a, f a fractional interest in that 
in that company. Maybe I have um, um, a 49 percent interest in the company. Um, historically, what would happen is the government would say, what would a hypothetical willing buyer pay and what would a hypothetical willing seller accept for a 49 percent interest, i.e. a non-controlling interest in a company? And so arriving at that valuation, we would start with what is the value of the company as a whole, and then we would maybe uh, layer on some uh, uh, discounting factors for the fact that if someone were purchasing that 49, a hypothetical person were purchasing that 49% interest, maybe it's not worth 49% of the whole. And those of you who work in the corporate world and you see M&A deals, you see that all the time. A, 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 a non-controlling interest is not worth necessarily the same as that percentage of the total. <clears throat> And so uh, that's, a, that's a real thing. And uh, with this change in the rules, essentially what the, what the Treasury Department is telling us is they're saying, we think that because it's a family, we're, we don't think that discount for lack of control, for example, is real. And so uh, what I think is that... Um, uh, <clears throat> the Treasury Secretary has perhaps never actually been a part of a family business because um, if any of you have ever been involved in a family business, you've probably seen that um, sometimes those things are very real. <clears throat> and so what this creates is a real problem because you might have a buy-sell arrangement in the, in the business whereby if grandpa dies, <clears throat> the business buys out his interest and that provides him some cash or his estate some cash. The problem is that his estate for tax purposes is going to be a bigger number than the amount of cash that he's going to get in his buyout. And that's a real problem. So <clears throat> grandpa's being taxed on a bigger number than the actual value that he owns. And that's a, that's a real problem and that's why there is a lot of uh, a lot of <coughs> hue and cry in a, in the halls of um, the Treasury Department today about this issue. Um, the problem is that the that the IRS has lost case after case after case on these valuation issues, and so they decided to just change the rules. Um, and so they, this is what they've done. Anyway, that's uh, just to kind of bring it home for you, uh, and, and it's going to come up in our, uh, in our planning discussion. Okay, so 2016, 2017, we still have a little bit of time left in 2016. Let's talk about planning opportunities, but let's start with being an environmentalist. Now, uh, this, we got the tree hugger here. What I'm really talking about here is not environmentalism in the sense of the tree hugger. What I'm talking about is what is the environment that we currently are experiencing for family wealth transfer, <clears throat> okay? Well, for one thing, so we're looking at the economic environment, <clears throat> okay? And I think it's important as we do planning for our clients, it's important to look at what is the economic environment. In other words, um, well, let's look at the uh, let's look at the tax rates. Well, we have high marginal tax rates, estate and gift tax rates, capital gain tax rates. When you factor in the federal and state <coughs> rules, you're talking about some some big numbers. And by the way, the estate and gift tax rate I've I've stated there is 40 percent is the federal rate. California doesn't have an estate uh, or, or gift tax, but some states do. And so you have to be careful that if your client has assets that are, uh, have situs or, or, or deemed situs outside of, of California, uh, let's say New York, for example, or Washington State, for example. Um, these are jurisdictions that have their own estate tax, and so you need to be aware that there is a possibility of a state estate or gift tax as well. Uh, 
<clears throat> the other factor that comes into play um, in the estate planning environment today is the low interest rate environment that we have. Now, <clears throat> I've been saying this for years. Uh, rates can't go any lower, can they? I mean, <clears throat> they got to go up at some point. Well, right now, the long-term applicable federal rate is 2.07% uh, for November, and the Section 7520 rate, which is a rate that's based on the midterm AFR, it's 120% of the midterm AFR, that's the, the 7520 rate is the rate that we use for a lot of estate planning transactions, it is 1.6%. So what that means is that we want to use planning strategies that take advantage of those low interest rates. Uh, situations, and particularly if we think that interest rates are likely to increase significantly, then um, that might create a, a planning or arbitrage to opportunity. What about the capital market <coughs> conditions? This is one of my favorite types of charts, and uh, this one I just stole off of, uh, I think it was Fidelity's website. You'll see there's a, a white box that runs across the middle of this thing, it, it, that's the one, that's the, the particular investment vehicle they're trying to sell. Uh, the, the point of this chart, the reason I'm, I'm putting it up here, though, is to show you that, and any of you that work in the investment field know and have seen these before, but the point is each of these colored boxes represents a, uh, a sector of the, of the economy. <clears throat> So we have the technology sector. Let, uh, let's take, for example, technology. Technology is that sort of purple box that in 2016 is third from the top. But if you follow the purple box, this ranks them according to which is the better for each year is across the top and which is the worst is for each year is across the bottom. So if you follow that technology sector, you can see it, this year it's made, uh, for 2016 so far it's third from the top. But if you go back to 2013, it was third from the bottom, and, and so it sort of goes around <clears throat> like that. So if anyone can predict what color ends up in what ranking each year, then you're going to make a lot of money, right? But uh, the reality is it's very difficult to predict. <clears throat> and so we want to we take into account some of this unpredictability as well. <clears throat> so what are our strategies? for 2016, 2017. I'm going to start with the old and boring ones. <clears throat> we have a gift tax annual exclusion of $14,000 per, don per donee per year. Uh, and for 2017, we don't know, but we're guessing it's going to be $14,000. Um, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we use make sure we, we use those, ex, those annual exclusions in an efficient way. Um, and so <clears throat> there is also an exclusion from the gift tax for certain medical and uh, educational expenses. So if grandpa wants to pay for granddaughter's college, grandpa can do that if he pays tuition directly to the institution. If he instead gives cash to, to, granddaughter, to granddaughter and says, use this for your tuition, that's a taxable gift. So we want to make sure grandpa makes the, the, the payment directly to the, or to the uh, educational institution and thereby avoiding, thereby allowing him to make a, a, an additional $14,000 cash gift to granddaughter, right? Uh, <clears throat> Beware at the bottom in red there, I think that's red, um, in, in red there we have beware of the GST annual exclusion <clears throat> because there, the, uh, the GST, Generation Skipping Transfer Tax, that Michael talked about uh, has a different set of rules for when the annual exclusion applies. So you have to be careful. Just because you got a gift tax annual exclusion because of those crummy letters that Michael talked about doesn't necessarily mean you got a generation skipping transfer tax annual exclusion, so be careful with that. Uh, what are some interest rate driven strategies? 
grantor retained annuity trusts, who knows what those are? I talked, if you were at tax camp last year, I talked about them. I'm sure you've got it memorized. Um, so grantor retained annuity trusts, I think last year I said, you know, interest rates have to go up by next year. Um, they didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's something called a charitable lead annuity trust. I talked about this one last year. Also driven by uh, uh, interest rates. <clears throat> Certain life insurance strategies uh, are driven by interest rates um, because uh, the... the um, uh, the, uh, the, the rates of, of uh, growth and value in the policy, inside the policies are affected by interest rates. Uh, so if we think that interest rates are likely to go up, that means probably your cash uh, value of a permanent life insurance policy is also going to accelerate in its uh, <coughs> value increases. Um, and then because of low interest rates, we can also use intrafamily lending strategies. And there are lots of different intrafamily lending strategies. And the concept there is, OK, <clears throat> I'm going to sell. Instead of dying with my 49% interest in um, the family business, I'm going to sell that 49% interest in the family business to, uh, <clears throat> to my uh, grandchild. <clears throat> and I'm going to sell that interest for a note, okay? What I've done by selling that interest is I'm able to sell that interest without regard to those crazy rules that Michael talked about that ignore the reality of fair market value. I can use real fair market value if I sell for a real fair market value. So I can sell at a decreased value, whereas if I die with a decreased value, that decreased value may not be recognized. So I can sell to my kid or my grandkid for a note. <clears throat> and guess what? <clears throat> the kid or the grandkid only has to pay me one of those tiny little interest rates. Maybe it's an interest-only note uh, over the coming years, and maybe it's a, a, a balloon payment at the end of 10 years, and if I'm 80, Chances are that balloon payment's not going to come due until I'm 90, <clears throat> and maybe I'm not around. And so <clears throat> it's a way of sort of freezing the value of that family business interest if I'm willing to relinquish it during my lifetime. If I uh, jump through a bunch of hoops to try and retain control, that creates a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of issues. But uh, uh, anyway, that's one type of strategy. But let's talk about <clears throat> the, the one that that I'm really um, interested in right now is, is called a CLAT, Charitable Lead Annuity Trust. We talked about it briefly last year. Uh, I want to just talk about it a little bit. The concept here is <clears throat> that uh, I make a transfer of an asset to a charitable lead annuity trust. The terms of that lead trust are that it pays ch to charity an income stream for a sp specific number of years. Why would I want to do that? Well, if I'm a wealthy person, a philanthropist, and I regularly make $50,000 per year in charitable gifts, or maybe it's $20,000 a year, or whatever it is, if I regularly make charitable gifts to my favorite charities, or maybe I have a family foundation, <clears throat> then uh, I'm going to be making those gifts anyway. Right? So why not commit to making those gifts, irrevocably commit to making those gifts, and use that commitment as a way of discounting the value of the gift that ends up, that ends up going to my kids? See, so what happens is I transfer an asset, or, or let's say it's cash. I transfer cash. That cash is invested. The income goes to the charity, and the remainder interest goes to my beneficiary. The concept there is that <clears throat> I have made a taxable gift to my beneficiary, but the gift, as it's valued for gift tax purposes, takes the fair market value as it went into the, to the lead trust, subtracts out the annuity to charity, and the remainder is the amount of my gift. So the concept is, as long as my net appreciation 
inside this charitable lead annuity trust exceeds the assumed appreciation, which was that 75-20 rate we talked about, 1.6%. So as long as I'm getting more than 1.6% in appreciation, I'm shifting appreciation to the next generation free of gift or estate tax. That's how that works, okay? Now I'm going to talk to you about a little twist on this that we, uh, we kind of like right now. We've got a couple of clients that we're doing this for, and that is the charitable lead annuity trust that is not intended to make a gift. <clears throat> this type of charitable lead annuity trust, the end beneficiary is me. You can see my beneficiary is not very happy there. But the concept here is, let's say you have a client <clears throat> who has just sold their company. Um, maybe they had RSUs that vested, and now they end up with shares in the acquiring company who, and the basis of my shares in the acquiring company is equal to the fair market value of those shares. So I have non-appreciated shares in, a, in a, an acquiring company. Or I just have cash. Okay? <clears throat> or I have any sort of high basis or basis approximately equal to fair market value uh, asset. <clears throat> What I can do is I can transfer that high basis asset to a charitable lead annuity trust. The, the lead trust, again, pays an annuity to charity, okay, an X amount of dollars every year to charity from that portfolio of investments, if you will, okay. And then at the end of the term of the trust, it comes back to me, okay. <clears throat> what I have done, and, and by the way, this particular type of charitable lead annuity trust is going to be structured as what we call a non-grantor lead annuity trust. So there are some drawbacks to it. But the concept here is what I've done is I've gotten a charitable contribution deduction equal to the present value of this future remainder interest. Okay? Remember your finance classes? Your Anyway, present value of that future remainder interest is my charitable contribution deduction in year zero. Okay? Uh, so if I have that transaction where I've sold my comp uh, my company's been sold, I've got now a big a big taxable income hit and high basis stock, uh, a charitable contribution deduction might be a pretty nice thing because I can get uh, I can get wait I said that wrong I apologize uh, I can get a charitable contribution deduction equal to not the present value of this remainder I said you didn't correct me Michael sorry. <laughs> anyway, the, the, yeah, okay, good. The charitable contribution deduction is, of course, the present value of the future payments to charity. Thank you. Uh, so the future payments to charity are my charitable contribution deduction, but I'm accelerating all those into year zero, and I'm getting the asset back at the end of year 10 or year 5 or whatever it is, okay? So what that's done is... <clears throat> If I think I'm going to be able to invest at greater than 1.6%, I have given away, I, I've accelerated, let's say, 10 years worth of charitable contribution deductions into year zero. And then in those future years when I've <clears throat> retired from the company, I'm no longer, I don't have this big income hit from the sale of the company, and I've no lo I'm, I'm retired, so I'm living off of my uh, my. <clears throat> investments, I'm not uh, getting a W-2 anymore, now um, I, I've gotten my charitable contribution deduction when it gives me the most benefit. <clears throat> Plus, I'm getting my asset back at the end of the term of the trust. So we like that technique. Uh, we think it, 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 it works pretty well. You, did you have a question? Yeah. So is that value based on the, the annuity? Um, the actual value of the annuity, or is that based on the, the interest rate? The, the, and uh, I know you, so I know why you're asking. The question, <laughs> the, va the value of, if you're asking the, the value of the charitable contribution deduction is equal to the present value of the annuity. So under the terms of the trust that I've created here, this is me, under the terms of the trust that I've created, I set how much 
goes to charity on an annual basis, okay? And the present value of those future income payments to charity is, is my uh, charitable contribution deduction, okay? Is that, is that from the interest rate? That that, no, that is set by the contract I have with the trustee in creating the charitable, uh, charitable annuity. But it works really well because interest rates are low, because I think I can invest a portfolio of assets at greater than 1.6%. And the, uh, the IRS is saying, we think you're going to get 1.6% on your money. And I'm saying, I think I can do better. So I'm going to end up with not only my original asset back, but some appreciation on that original asset with only my income going to the charity. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's, that's the concept there. Sorry for getting that swapped in my head. Uh, okay. So, yeah, oh, we got a question. Yes. Going back to the first slide. Yes, uh-huh. When you say grant or trust, that means the income on the trust will be taxed as settler. The, right. This one, this one is a non-grantor trust. No, 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 this oh, I'm sorry. This, was, this one's a non-grantor trust. Thank you. This is the grantor trust. So the income of this thing, yes, exactly. So the income of this thing gets gets taxable to the settlor. But remember, if I'm let's say let's say it's a piece of rental property in here, you could have income going to charity and the appreciation coming back here. The income would be taxable to me, okay? And the but the appreciation, I'm not paying tax on that anyway. That's going to come back to me. I'm going to die, and then I'm going to get my stepped-up basis. So the concept is, yes, I'm going to pay income tax on that income, but I'm doing it in a year when my income tax rates are lower because I have retired. Right? I just want to ask, like, yeah. for this particular class, uh, unlike the one where it's a non-grantor trust, this one is more of an income tax planning strategy than, say, an estate tax planning strategy because you're getting the asset back in this case, so you're not right. removing it necessarily from your That's estate. right. So it's, it's purely an income tax play as opposed to this one, which is purely a gift tax play. Okay, We're shifting wealth to junior here. Um, this one... We're not shifting wealth to junior. We're just getting an income tax deduction. Okay? All right. Considerations for CPAs. We, these are good for CPAs because CPAs, those that do valuation work, there's work in terms of valuation. Uh, there, is, uh, th there are uh, lots of reporting issues to deal with. There's a 709, et cetera, regardless of whether it's a grantor or a non-grantor. Okay, the other technique that we like today is the concept of getting income out of California. This is, an, again, an income tax planning strategy. And just to look at, uh, again, once again, California gets rated uh, among the 10 worst business tax climates in the United States, according to um, Tax Foundation. <clears throat> so uh, lucky us. So the, the, the other technique that we've been doing a fair amount of lately is shifting assets out of California for income tax purposes. And one of the techniques that we use, again, this is one I talked about last year, um, but it hadn't, hasn't gotten any better, so we think it still works today, uh, and that is how do we get at income out of California if I'm still here? Right? I'm the taxpayer. I'm still here. How can I get my income out of California? So one of the techniques that we use is called a Del Delaware Incomplete Gift Non-Grantor Trust, or DING, okay? Also called a WING if it's in Wyoming, or a STING if it's in South Dakota, or a NING if it's in Nevada. But we, you'll notice we chose states where uh, the uh, trust income tax rates are zero, for trusts created by people outside of those states. So Delaware works really well, South Dakota works really well, and so do those, some of those other states. Okay, how do we do that? Well, I transfer my, let's say I have a, a liquidity event coming, I transfer my shares in XYZ stock to this trustee located in Delaware. The Delaware trustee then is the seller of those shares at the time that the company is sold. Therefore, 
I'm not paying 13.3% California taxes on that, uh, on those, uh, the sale of those shares. <clears throat> the terms of the trust are that the trustee has the discretion to pay, to distribute to my desired beneficiaries, or by the way, you'll notice this little thin guy here, or to me, okay? Because of the fact that I am a permissible distributee, we don't know whether this is a complete, we don't know who this gift is to. It is to either my beneficiaries or to me. It might come back to me. Because it might come back to me, it's considered an incomplete gift. Therefore, when I transferred these shares to the Ding Trust, there's no gift tax. <clears throat> Instead, the Ding Trust sells the shares, pays the federal tax, no state tax, and then Five, about six or six to ten years later, distributes the assets back to me or to my kids. How do I know that the that the trustee is going to distribute those um, to the people that I want uh, them distributed to? And the answer is because they want future business, and the Delaware trustee is in the business of being a friendly trustee, and if they don't. If they, if they get a reputation for being unreliable or unpredictable in how they manage the assets in the trust, in this discretionary trust that I've created, they're not going to get future business. So as long as it's a long-time uh, <coughs> trust company that I trust, they're not going to run off to Acapulco with my money, then they're going to do kind of what I expected them to do, okay? But I have to be prepared to relinquish that control, and that's uh, often not very attractive for many of our clients. Uh, beware of the strategy because <clears throat> California courts haven't really tested it yet. We think it works, um, um, but uh, uh, I'm not sure it's been tested uh, in, from a California tax standpoint, but uh, we, we think there's no reason why it shouldn't work. Um, it's not specifically cont contemplated by statute. And Whoops, that's not the one I wanted. Uh, and then beware also that California has a throwback rule, which means that if there's income earned in Delaware by the Ding Trust and it's distributed three years later to a California beneficiary, uh, California is going to look back and pretend it was distributed in the year that it was earned. So as long as it's held inside that ding trust for five years, you're going to be safe, okay? So again, uh, this is, I sound like a rec uh, broken record because um, for those of you who are under the age of 30, that's a record. <laughs> and it used to be this vinyl thing. You put a needle on there and it played music. <clears throat> retro now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, what's not back is what they used to have when I was a kid, which was if you had a scratch in the record, it would skip, and it would just repeat, repeat, repeat. And so you ha if you put a nickel on this little guy right here, it would go right through the scratch, and it would keep going. <clears throat> so put a nickel on the needle. So in other words, you're sick of hearing last year's planning ideas. Let's talk about this year, and uh, then I'm almost done here. Uh, <clears throat> number one is... Let's take advantage of these gifts of family business interests before the regulations that Michael described become final. So if we have clients <coughs> that uh, have family business interests and they're looking to transfer those anyway, let's get them done sooner rather than later because we don't know what the final regulations are going to look like, but we're pretty sure we don't want them to look like what they're looking like right now, as proposed. So let's get those gifts done before the current proposed regulations become final, okay? Number two, if the regulations as they currently, currently exist are made final, we might have to s switch up the way we do business. It used to be that 
we always wanted to wrap a gift in a family limited partnership or a family LLC so that we could create these discounts based on lack of marketability, lack of control. Now, maybe we just want to ha give naked assets. Let me give you an example. If I, if I own this building, and let's say it's worth $25 million. I don't know what it's worth. Let's say it's worth $25 million. <coughs> If I own this building and I, and I wrap it in an LLC and I make a gift of a 10% LLC interest to my kid, the government is going to tell me that I've made a $2.5 million taxable gift, even though if I hire an appraiser to appraise that 10% LLC interest in the LLC that owns this property, they're going to say maybe it's really only a $2 million gift or a $1.8 million gift. So rather than do that, <clears throat> rather than make it equal to 2.5 million, let's just make it a gift of the property itself and a fractional interest in the property because the new regulations do not cover fractional interests in the property, okay? And it's better for property tax uh, basis anyway. That's all, folks. Thank you. Thank you.